Welcome to part two of this three-part series on the past, present, and future of time in physics. Today we will focus on the transition from Lorentz ether theory to special relativity. We'll look at uh, the last version of Lorentz ether theory after it was modified to accommodate the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment. And we'll give a detailed discussion of what happened to physics in 1905. And I strongly believe that this context of looking at that transition from Lorentz ether theory to special relativity will really give great insight to special relativity. Lorentz ether theory was developed in the 19th century, where the focus was on trying to understand the phenomenon of light and electromagnetic waves. Many different theories were floated out and uh, debated and considered, and further there were many experiments which influenced those debates and the thinking of various physicists. To me, it seemed like a period of a true scientific method, not perfect by any means, but definitely using the scientific method, and it yielded real progress step by step. Early Lorentz uh, ether theory was based on classical physics absolute time and space, except that really the ether took the place of space. It was motion with respect to the ether that caused a lot of physics phenomenon. And the idea was that the Earth and all the other planets move through a motionless ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment was performed in 1887. The Michelson-Morley experiment, often abbreviated MMX, was designed to measure the speed of the Earth through the motionless ether. Well, the results were shocking to Lorentz and most etherists, as it seemed to protect no or very little Earth motion with respect to the Earth, the ether, uh, far less than was expected. So this was a catalyst to Lorentz rethinking parts of the ether theory. This is a most important slide. After the Michelson-Morley experiment, showed that they could not detect any motion of the Earth relative to the motionless ether. That shocked Lorentz, as that was inconsistent with the early Lorentz ether theory. So, to address those Michelson-Morley experiment results, Lorentz reconciled LAT to those results by adding physical length contraction and physical clock retardation or clock slowing as a function of absolute velocity with respect to the ether. In LAT, the ether is the preferred frame. Now, all along, the, from early LAT to after L, L, MMX, the ether rest frame was the only frame where the speed of light was seen in all directions. But because of the MMX results, it was added to LAT that all observers would measure the speed of light as C in all inertial frames. So we'll look at how these three changes to LAT were handled in the transition to special relativity. 
Let's look at this translation from Lorentz ether theory to special relativity in detail. Einstein essentially took Lorentz ether theory, often abbreviated LAT or LET, and changed it from a preferred frame theory to all frames are equal, each with its own idiosyncratic view of what's happening physically. Step one, Lorentz ether length contraction and clock slowing equations look mathematically identical to special relativity's length contraction and time dilation equations. So that's a direct <laughs> taking from LAT to SR. However, in LAT, the velocity, V in those equations, represents absolute velocity with respect to the ether, whereas for special relativity, the V is relative to each inertial observer. So while the math looks identical, Basically, the physical interpretations of those two equations are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Let's take a still closer look. In LAT, there is one and only one physical model, with absolute velocity being measured with respect to the preferred frame. Further, in LAT, clocks and meter sticks at rest with the ether are the fastest and longest, respectively. In contrast, in special relativity, each observer sees physics as if his frame was the single preferred frame of LAT. For example, each observer thinks that his clocks are the fastest clocks and that his meter sticks are the longest meter sticks. And also, they see the speed of light being seen in all directions in their frame. So, basically what he's done is uh, take an LAT and its single preferred frame and made each inertial frame into the single preferred frame in his SR model. So in LAT, clock slowing is an asymmetric physical effect. In contrast, in special relativity, its analog time dilation must be just observed and not physical. Or just observed, it's like uh, two twins who separate and each sees the other shrink. It's a purely optics <laughs> effect. And there's no physical shrinking going on at all. Further, if one interprets special relativity time dilation as a symmetric physical, a asymmetric physical phenomenon, a contradiction immediately arises. Like in the fourth bullet, we see that Herbert Dingle says that that interpretation of special relativity as describing what's happening physically requires that clock A works more slowly than clock B and clock B works more slowly than clock A. As if that weren't enough, uh, if you interpret special relativity as describing physical reality, that's at odds with the relativity principle, as we'll show in detail later. Lorentz's original Lorentz transformation that were developed for the 
modified version of Lorenz Ethan Fit Theory after MMX. They transformed from the single preferred frame view to another frame's view of space and time. And the reverse transform was a true physical inverse. If you use the Lorenz's original LTs and found that B's clock was moving or accumulating time at half the rate of A's, and then you use the inverse, you determine that A's clock was moving twice as fast as B's. Uh, quite consistent with the physical, true physical uh, effect. However, when Einstein re-derived the LTs for special relativity, from special relativity's length contraction and time dilation, they were used to transform between any two inertial frames. And the inverse transform was not a true physical inverse. It was the same equation, or really a mirror image equation, which is only consistent with special relativity's length contraction and time dilation, uh, describing just observed and not physical effects. LAT yields a single physical model that all use. And LAT's length contraction and clock retardation are asymmetric physical effects. In contrast, special relativity is observer-centric with an infinite number of different and conflicting space-time models that are all claimed to be equally valid physics models. However, that transition to special relativity drains most of the physics out of special relativity's infinite number of models, allegedly describing what's happening physically. We'll take a closer look at that coming up. Since much of academia has a strong negative emotional reaction to the term ether, I'll refer to Lorentz ether theory as Lorentz preferred frame theory here, as that's really the level, the conceptual level that we're talking about. We don't get into the details of the, of the ether itself at all. So we've been looking at the transition from Lorentz preferred frame theory to special relativity. And seeing that basically special relativity took Lorentz ether theory, including the three constructs that Lorentz came up with to modify Lorentz ether theory uh, and address the results of MMX, namely Lorentz uh, length contraction which became a different kind of length contraction in special relativity, clock retardation or clock slowing, which became time dilation in special relativity, and uh, that all observers would measure special, uh, the speed of light as C which became the second relativity principle, the principle of the constancy of the speed of light in all inertial frames. Well, that one change that Einstein used to turn Lorentz ether theory topsy-turvy was the relativity principle. 
Now that principle was characterized by Einstein many times as saying that all inertial observers, very different uh, views of physics were equally valid. So now that raises the big question that we will address next. That question is, was the transition from a single physical model with a single preferred frame in motion with respect to a specific physical entity to special relativity's infinite number of observer-centric space-time models, where space can morph into time and time can morph into space, a step forward or a step backwards? If you come to this talk uh, as a confirmed relativist or you have the opinion that special relativity must be right because uh, physics academia says so, uh, try and be open-minded on that topic. As we make a few points below, special relativity, as we have seen, took LAT's single preferred frame model and changed it so that every inertial frame sees itself as the single preferred frame. Now, that's kind of a dubious assumption to make. In fact, it's, it's an incorrect assumption. When I've talked to relativists, they say things like, well, special relativity has been proved by the empirical data to nine decimal places. However, the early empirical data also supported or in Cetha theory. For example, in accelerators, it was not determined whether these effects were asymmetric and physical or symmetric and just observed, because we only gathered data from one point of view, from the lab operator, and not from, say, the particle's point of view. Further, more recently, that question has been determined whether the data really is symmetric or asymmetric. And the GPS data shows consistently that the asymmetric model is correct and the symmetric model is incorrect, despite claims to the reverse. Now, a relativist might say, well, special relativity is the foundation of all modern physics. Well, space-time physics has led to constructs like dark matter and dark energy, which are really fudge factors to bridge the gap between relativistic predictions and the empirical data. So those are fudge factors. I call them dark fudge factors. Further, in Big Bang inflation, which has says that the size of the universe increased by a factor of something like 10 to the 36, which is unimaginably large uh, increase, in 10 to the minus 30 second of a second, which is a, unimaginably small amount of time and that the start and stop of that inflation period is uh, unknown, that seems like a great, uh, another fudge factor to me. Let's look a little closer at one of the points on the open-minded on the validity of special relativity. We'll look at the GPS system. To compute the velocity effect on clock rate, GPS uses the Lorentz preferred frame method. 
It uses satellite velocity with respect to a single preferred frame, namely the Earth-centered inertial frame, and the surface of the Earth's velocity with respect to a single preferred frame, still the easy I-frame, and then how, computes how much the satellite clocks will be slowed by velocity compared to the Earth-bound clocks. Well, if instead they had used special relativity's time dilation as a function of relative velocity between the clocks, which is what special relativity requires, gives a very different result. And in fact, many contradictory results because uh, on different positions of the rotating Earth, clocks will have a different relative velocity compared to a single satellite clock. And all of those predictions are contrary to the GPS data. What was the academic reaction to the transition that we just talked about? Well, initially, there was much opposition to Einstein's clock paradox claim became the twin paradox claim. It claimed that special relativity's time dilation causes clock slowing, physical clock slowing. And academia asked, how can a symmetric effect like time dilation cause an asymmetric result as claimed in special relativity. Well, after a while, since special relativity was derived from first principles, whereas Lorentz modified LT with an ad hoc fix after MMX showed there was a problem, uh, they tend they started to um, get behind special relativity. Then, after general relativity was developed, it had really beautiful math. The academics really loved it. Um, even though, well, general relativity was claimed to be proved by some observations of an eclipse of the sun, but later examination showed that, uh, first of all, the person doing the experiment was doing cherry picking on the data and that basically the results did not back general relativity. And later data from NASA showed that, no, there is no bending like general relativity predicts. Uh, outside the corona, which is just a case of the light being bent by a different index of refraction that it's going through. In any event, so that's how relativity won the hearts and therefore the minds of academia. Even though in 1916, Einstein recanted on his clock paradox claim about special relativity it's a time dilation causing clock slowing. Very interesting. Now we will look at how special relativity deals with the construct of time. And to do that, I'm going to repeat three very important charts from the first talk. So if you've already memorized those charts from the first presentation, you can go browse to the email for a while. Special relativity, which gets rid of time in physics in many ways. First of all, it replaces absolute time with relative to the observer time. And if you read the 1905 paper, it's very interesting that 
There's no attempt by Einstein to say, oh, here's the reasons with absolute time, and here's the benefits of going to relative to the observer time. Uh, and that is mostly true in terms of the physics community. You might assume that such a dramatic change in uh, paradigm would be at least debated, or even if everyone instantly agreed that they would enumerate all of the benefits of this change, but no, some peripheral comments, of course, but in general, no, we would just accept it. Uh, furthermore, Einstein redefines time in terms of the speed of light and assumes that the speed of light is constant for all observers in all inertial frames for both the speed of light approaching those observers and the speed of light receding from all those observers. And this is implemented into special relativity in the following way. If you're going to use special relativity in an inertial frame, you have to synchronize your clocks using Einsteinian synchronization, which goes like this. You send a signal from clock A to clock B, and it, that signal is sent back to clock A. When it gets to A, A notes the total time for that clock, uh, for that round trip of light. It then divides that total time in half by assuming it takes the same amount of time to go from A to B as it does to have light go from B to A, regardless of the motion of that inertial frame. So if you do that, if you synchronize your clocks that way, regardless of physical reality, then you're guaranteed to measure the speed of light as being uh, a constant C, whether that light wave is going away from A towards B or towards A from B. So the net result is that time equals the length of the path that it's traveled divided by C. Time is defined in terms of speed of light and assumes that the speed of light is constant for all inertial frames. Still another way that special relativity gets rid of time in physics is the construct of relative simultaneity. Each inertial frame, an inertial observer, has their own idiosyncratic view of what's simultaneous. For example, for some event X that A observes as being simultaneous with his present, present state, there will be another observer who sees X as simultaneous with an event in A's future and a third observer who sees X as simultaneous with an event in A's past. Hence, in special relativity, there's no global past, present, future. Each observer has their own construct of past, present, future, and of what's simultaneous. Lee continues, special relativity and general relativity gets rid of time. In the relativistic universe, it's like a timeless unity. The flow of time is an illusion. Relativity's reality is there's no global past, present, or future. All there is is a four-dimensional space-time, whereas time is not separate from space. And that four-dimensional space-time is like a frozen block of ice. 
In special relativity's construct of space-time, in Einstein's words, space and time are subjective ways of dividing up a four-dimensional reality. In relativity, the universe is a mathematical, geometric object called by all well, the block universe view. Let's look at the twin paradox. It's a topic that I'm intimately familiar with. I've studied it for around 60 years. Um, in 1905, Einstein alleged that special relativity, symmetric time dilation, predicted an asymmetric result due to physical clock slow. So we'll look at a typical twin paradox scenario. We start with twins A and B at rest in a specific frame. Let's call it the A frame. Then twin B accelerates and moves at a constant velocity in the uh, B's outbound frame until he meets up with uh, another uh, person at rest in the A frame. He then turns around and comes back to be at rest again next to his twin A, the location where he started. Einstein claimed that when he came back, B's clock would have accumulated less time due to time dilation. And it's noted earlier that this, this claim um, was really puzzling to many physicists in, the, in 1905 and the next few years. But uh, this problem tried to be reconciled. Because time dilation is supposed to be a function of relative velocity. And B's relative velocity to A is uh, really the same as A's relative velocity to B. So that's a symmetric situation. So, relativists tried to reconcile this by saying, okay, B can't use special relativity, can't invoke the time dilation equation because B experiences acceleration and special relativity only holds for um, inertial frames. Well, this <laughs> attempt at a rebuttal was really worse than the allegation because if an observer and his instruments can't be used or can't use special relativity if they've accelerated in the past or accelerated in the future, then special relativity is, can't be used at all. It's useless. Further, one can modify that basic twin paradox scenario and not have B start at rest in the A frame, but already being in the B frame and uh, going at constant velocity in the outbound leg. And when he passes by A at an arbitrarily close, uh, he can uh, synchronize his clock with A. And there's no problem of a relative simultaneity since they're arbitrarily close. And there can be a B prime who's moving in the opposite direction and who, in essence, does the inbound leg of the round trip. And uh, when B prime passes B, where, where uh, A prime is also at, um, Again, B prime and B can compare clocks, and since they're arbitrarily close, there's no problem about 
relative simultaneity. And special relativity, in essence, predicts the same amount of net proper time difference, the same amount of uh, difference in the amount of accumulated clock readings between A and B, or B, B prime. So uh, now we've eliminated <laughs> accelerations and eliminated that rebuttal, but it's uh, accelerations means that B can't lose use special relativity. Uh, another rebuttal argument from the relativists goes down the drain. So if the relativist uh, claims that special relativity's inherently symmetric time dilation equation causes physical clock slowing, which is inherently asymmetric, then he has an immediate logic flaw for special relativity because he has to say that A will see his clock as the fastest and B will see his clock as the fastest. So it came up with a little sleight of hand and said, well, if we can get rid of B and only look at A, then the, the flaw isn't obvious. But the problem is that special relativity's um, reconciliation argument that B experiences experience acceleration and therefore uh, B can't use special relativity produces an even worse problem, an even worse flaw for uh, special relativity. Since we just discussed the twin paradox scenario, let's use the twin paradox to make another point. Special relativity's relative simultaneity removes the physics from special relativity. In discussing the twin paradox with relativists, I'd say how much of the net proper time difference had accumulated at various points along the way of that round trip. For example, uh, the midpoint, the turnaround point. Well, let's say we had um, a spaceship going out to visit some asteroid outside the solar system that was uh, near enough to being at rest with the Earth, so that the speed out to the asteroid and the speed back was uh, the same. Um, so we'll say it took, uh, from the point of view of Earth, it took 10 years for that spaceship to make that round trip, and the speed was 0 0.866, uh, the speed of light, which means the Lorentz factor was one half. So according to special relativity, uh, the clocks on that spaceship should only show a passage of five years. So the net proper time difference between the two clocks would be five years. So what would be uh, that net proper time difference at the, at the midpoint? Well, if you go to billet two, um, really one half in, in special relativity, one half the net proper time difference must accumulate at the midpoint because of symmetry. Otherwise, the physics of special relativity would be direction dependent. If you accumulated more or less time on the outbound leg than in the inbound leg or vice versa, then the physics would be direction dependent, which would be a violation of the relativity principle. Um, if you could 
if the physics was direction dependent, then you could put all frames uh, into a hierarchy, and uh, one that had the fastest clock rate would be uh, the preferred frame. So the question I asked, how much of the net proper time difference had accumulated at various points of a twin paradox scenario was not inherently meaningless. It was just inherently meaningless in the context of special relativity's infinite number of inconsistent views. If all of the inertial frames views are considered to be equally valid and they all differ each other and contradict, then you can't uh, be discussing what causes what and what are the physical causes. So that's an example how relative simultaneity in special relativity hides a detailed description of what's happening physically. The only thing that you can determine in special relativity is the final total net proper time difference when the two twins get back together again. Because if they're together, then there's no effect of relative simultaneity. They're right next to each other. So special relativity can uh, sometimes predict the total effect of a long process, but the details of what's occurring in that process are inherently unanswerable in special relativity. We'll continue to look at the twin paradox, and after Relativists gave up on the species argument of B can't use special relativity because uh, B accelerates. Uh, they can try to come up with some other reconciliation arguments for the difference in clock readings for a round trip. The problem was all these arguments used a cause for this clock slowing that was different than special relativity's time dilation. So all of those arguments implied that special relativity did not cause the clock slowing. Another attempt was flawed because basically the argument assumed that the stay at home frame in a twin paradox scenario would always be the single preferred frame. Hence, they shifted from special relativities, all frames are the same, to a Lorentz preferred frame type of theory uh, that had a single preferred frame. Or thirdly, they used just observed time and hence we couldn't be talking about a physical clock slowing instead of proper time. So Einstein was troubled by this debate and he wrote about it uh, during uh, uh, between 1905 and 1916 and he, he was having problems uh, trying to reconcile the problems that were raised by critics. And even Einstein abandoned this twin paradox claim that special relativity's time dilation uh, was describing physical clock slowing. He did that in 1916. But the rest of physics academia kept on claiming that the twin paradox had been resolved and that uh, special relativity's time dilation could explain asymmetric clock slow. Well, uh, our 
organization of critical thinking physicists uh, sent out a request to universities to address this problem about the twin paradox. And the mainstream response actually was the strongest indictment of special relativity time dilation describing physical clock slowing. Even though that's what they were trying to do, their arguments ended up being an indictment of that claim. If you want more details, you can go to that URL at the bottom of the page and uh, look up mainstream response, response page in the navigation bar and get, get all the details in the mainstream professor's uh, quotes. Continually looking at the twin paradox, note that a dozen mutually exclusive reconciliation arguments trying to reconcile special relativity with uh, cl physical clock slowing were accepted by academia and none were rejected. Furthermore, there were no rebuttals to any of the uh, mutually exclusive reconciliation arguments. It seemed that if anyone came up with an argument for special relativity, it was accepted and uh, not argued against. Uh, and then eventually, if one claimed there was a pro twin paradox problem, you were censured without really the argument being considered. Furthermore, each of those mutually exclusive reconciliation arguments was an implicit rejection of the assertion that special relativity's time dilation described a physical effect, because those reconciliation arguments were based on using something other than special relativity's time dilation as the cause for clock slowing. And um, that logic for rebutting the twin paradox is not confined to just the special case of that twin paradox scenario. It also shows that in general, special relativity time dilation is not describing what's happening physically. Wrapping up our discussion of the twin paradox, few notes. Professor Herbert Dingle was very well respected um, physics professor in his era. He was a relativist and the author of a textbook on special relativity. But then he came across the twin paradox and he concluded that the twin paradox claim unavoidably leads to a contradiction. And he then became a critic of special relativity and wrote a very famous book in that regard. Turning to the empirical evidence, GPS, which is a highly credible data source because the system works to a high degree of precision, doesn't matter what anyone thinks the system works. And the data shows that clock retardation, clock slowing, is asymmetric and physical. And it's a function of absolute velocity with respect to a single preferred frame, the ECI frame. If you try to apply special relativity and relative velocity with respect to uh, Another frame, you'll be sending people off into the forest or the lakes uh, and the, you get more and more incorrect results, the more the, your selected preferred frame differs from the ECI frame. 
and it's not just uh, this twin paradox area, but the data for half-light extension of muons that are created in the upper atmosphere shows that either their half-light is greatly extended physically due to their high velocity as they approach the Earth, um, or the muons much, must travel much faster than the speed of light in violation of special relativity. Often, we'll hear relativists say that special relativity has the limited domain of inertial frames. Well, first of all, that doesn't seem to really make good sense, because if you have some velocity effects, that's valid physics, and then you accelerate by one millionth of a percent, then that effect suddenly stops. Uh, it's hard, it's just hard to picture that as valid physics. Anyway, I think what really happened was that when Einstein was doing his math analysis uh, for velocity effects, he naturally found it was much easier if you limited it to constant velocity because then uh, you didn't have to deal with acceleration and its attendant forces uh, because then you'd have to uh, figure out how to clearly separate the effects of these of the new uh, force that was causing the acceleration from the pure velocity effects. Second, if it was really true that special relativity could only be used when observer and observed were in inertial frames, special relativity would be worthless. Uh, it would even rule out have, uh, applying it if there had been past or would be future accelerations. It would be hard to find a, an environment that was a true inertial frame. Furthermore, looking at this from the empirical point of view, the accelerator data confirms that velocity and energy level effects are a function of instantaneous velocity. Whether the velocity is 100% constant or accelerating. And those, veloc those instantaneous velocity effects are not in any way limited to inertial frames. Um, such books as Gravitation by uh, Archibald Wheeler and uh, Thorne uh, are rather explicit on this point. But one thing one has to look out for is that sometimes the claim uh, that special relativity is limited to inertial frames is used by relativists without justification to finesse special relativity contradictions and empirical data mismatches. For example, uh, I've heard uh, relativists on Monday say uh, the GPS system is built on special relativity, which obviously is, has very little to do with it, inertial limitation to inertial frames. But on Tuesday, when they're confronted with the empirical data showing that the velocity effects are 100% opposed to special relativity, that they are asymmetric physical effects, then the relativists say, oh, uh, that data doesn't apply because special relativity, the domain is limited to inertial frames. 
Since the primary focus in this presentation is time, let's look at simultaneity. Simultaneity uh, is really a man-made construct, but does it have a physical meaning? Well, let's look at this example. If a light signal arrives from an event and the observer knows the signal took three seconds to travel from the event, then it's reasonable to say that the event occurred three observer proper time seconds ago. So if you really know what's going on physically, you can define simultaneity um, in an absolute way consistent with that physics understanding. So if you, if you have a solid physics theory, then uh, absolute simultaneity will uh, drop out naturally. Uh, but if your theory is talking about naive observations, uh, then you're going to have some problems. It has to be based in the reality of what's happening physically. So this poses another interesting question. Why then does special relativity imply relative simultaneity? Well, I think the answer is because special relativity has an infinite number of incompatible space-time models, one for each observer. If one takes the models one at a time and assumes the second postulate and or Einsteinian synchronization is valid, then relative simultaneity must result. The problem arises when one tries to look at two physically inconsistent models at once. In contrast, if all observers use LAT's single physical preferred frame model, they will all agree on what's physically and absolutely simultaneous. Earlier we saw that there was an inherent inconsistency between relative simultaneity and the relativity principle of special relativity. Um, let's look further. Let's say that light goes between two separate events, E1 and E2. Well, in special relativity, different observers label their coordinates differently, but that doesn't mean that the above occurs differently for each observer's view of space-time. Further, the empirical data from GPS says that the single, coherent, physical approach to simultaneity works and is even required. As a final point on simultaneity, even though different observers will indeed have different perspectives and different observations about reality, a model of physical reality and of what's actually happening physically must be built on a single coherent view. So how do we move away from a metaphysical view of time or special relativity's relative time to a good construct for building good physics? Well, we do that by replacing time, quote unquote, with proper time, which is a great physics construct which is operationally defined. For time, we need to define locally uh, a standard of absolute 
proper time, right? And then extend that by interrelating all of the different local proper time rates to get a global, uh, consistent global uh, absolute time. For example, we have uh, a time rate on the surface of the Earth, maybe two, um, and on Jupiter, maybe one. So we know how to correlate uh, time on the surface of Jupiter to time on the surface of the Earth. And we just continue using that methodology. In fact, that's really using GPS's methodology. It determined the proper time rate for clocks at rest in the preferred frame, which in the vicinity of the Earth is the ECI frame. And then it uses theory and experiment to relate that standard rate to other proper times, uh, time rates, for clocks at other locations in other states of motion. And that leads to a, a universal time, at least in the uh, locale of the Earth. And as I say, that can be extended uh, to the entire universe if we have uh, enough physics knowledge. While this three-part series of uh, primary focus is on time, uh, certainly in a very important sub-theme is absolute versus relative. So I'll show a few slides uh, discussing that point. Uh, this slide talks about relative velocity and, of course, uh, time is part of the definition of velocity. We'll look at the Doppler effect, and it's built on the construct of relative velocity, meaning relative to the observer. So I contend it doesn't describe what's happening physically. At best, it describes what's just observed and gives a misleading implication of what's happening physically. Okay, is relative velocity um, the physical cause and effect mechanism for the Doppler effect? Well, let's take a look at an example of uh, someone on Earth observing light from a star five billion years ago, and they note the Doppler effect, and they from that they compute what the relative velocity must be. Well, let's think of the case of uh, observing a star that's five billion light years away. So when the light is emitted from that star, uh, the Earth isn't in existence. And certainly the telescope and the observer aren't in existence. Further, let's say that after three billion years, the star itself explodes in a supernova and is scattered throughout the universe. So when the light is received on Earth, the star doesn't exist. So it's hard to think of the relative velocity between the star and the telescope as an important description of what's happening physically. Further, Professor Frankel, Frankel yes, has shown that the special relativity Doppler effect gives the same answer as a model using velocity of the source relative to its local light medium and velocity of the observer relative to his local light medium. So one can describe that the Doppler effect phenomenon in terms of local 
physics. And perhaps that gives a better idea of what's really happening physically than using the construct of relative velocity. Next, we'll look at absolute or relative kinetic energy. Special relativities, relative kinetic energy construct, and symmetric effects have no physical reality. They are abstract math inventions, which may or may not be useful in some cases. For example, special relativity assigns a wide range of relative kinetic energy values to each particle. Hence, special relativity's construct of relative kinetic energy is not a physical property of a particle. It's an abstract construct for math analysis. If kinetic energy is a valid physical description of what's happening physically, then it must be single-valued. It must be an absolute kinetic energy construct. Now, I know that some people uh, dismiss energy and kinetic energy, but that's a topic for another day. Regarding absolute versus relative, let's look at the preferred frame and clock rates. Well, we know that clocks at rest in the same frame, other things being equal, such as gravitational potential, accumulate proper time at the same rate. So, there's two possibilities. All frames have the same clock rate, but if you interpret special relativity's time dilation equation as being able to describe a physical effect, then that interpretation of special relativity rules against that option. And in fact, the empirical data <laughs> shows that that option is not correct. Therefore, using special relativity without interpretation, we must have all frames do not have the same clock rate. If that's true, regardless of how you interpret special relativity due to empirical data, then the frames can be ordered by clock rate, yielding a hierarchy where the frame with the fastest rate, other things being equal, is the preferred frame. And GPS shows that that conclusion is correct. And in fact, in the vicinity of the Earth, that preferred frame is the ECI frame. If one claims that special relativity's construct of relative velocity yields physical effects, that in turn yields a flaw. We're going to use the same first bullet, which I found is very useful in showing flaws in special relativity. We know the clocks at rest in the same frame, other things being equal, have the same clock rate. So, if special relativity claims that accelerating from being at rest in frame A to being at rest in frame B reduces the clock rate for the accelerated clock, then special relativity, if consistently applied, must also claim that accelerating from being at rest in frame B to being at rest in frame A reduces the clock rate. Hence, if we take a clock from frame A and move it to frame B and then move it back to being at rest in frame A, 
it will have undergone two clock slowings and must be slower than the rest of the clocks in frame A, which violates the same clock rate rule in bullet one. QED. Okay, we'll wrap up with a multi-part objective summary and conclusion. Einstein took Lorentz ether theory's high-level conceptual preferred frame model and transformed it into a multi-observer centric model based on a false assumption, namely, assuming there was no preferred frame, no ether, or even if there was a preferred frame, it was unfindable. Well, GPS tells us that the preferred frame in the vicinity of the Earth is the ECI frame. And special relativity is really built on the construct of uh, frames, but frames, is, uh, frames are a mathematical abstract construction. So I much prefer to think in terms of preferred physical entities. And uh, we have velocity res with respect to a specific physical entity and that relative local motion um, is what causes the physical effects. So we have the ECI frame, and that suggests that maybe the preferred physical entity is the gravitational field, the non-rotating gra gravitational field. Um, we know that velocity effects are a function of of velocity with respect to the gravitational field. And uh, the location of the object within the gravitational field, uh, and specifically the gravitational potential of that location where the object is, where the clock is. <laughs> and some Additional summary points. If special relativity's velocity effects are claimed to be just observed, then special relativity is at odds with GPS and the Halfley Keating experiment data. On the other hand, if special relativity's velocity effects are claimed to be physical, then contradictions arise internal contradictions. And the theory is still at odds with the data, which is uh, very asymmetric data. To wrap up, I'll make an objective summary. Both Lee and Nick of Time conclude that time needs to be reborn into physics. We need absolute time with absolute past, present, future, and a preferred rest frame, but not necessarily a return to Newtonian absolute time, where time is pictured as sort of a separate uh, entity and dimension uh, where there's a universal clock that ticks off what's really time. Lee's solution was to use general relativity for some things and shape dynamics for the rest. However, I would think that there should be a more physical approach that's not dependent on a patchwork of ad hoc fixes to relativity, such as dark matter, dark energy, the inflation period in the Big Bang, or shaped dynamics. To see that more physical approach, see the future of time, which is part three of these talks.